Welcome to another episode of Dr. Brooke on the Block. It's time to grab a seat, buckle up, and take a ride with me through the wild, wild west of the Web3 universe, where we're going to learn all about coins and tokens, NFTs and contracts, digital real estate and the metaverse, and so much more. There is a lot to get through on the block, but I am here to pave the way and help you avoid those nasty pitfalls and rug pulls so you don't get hurt. I'm going to also introduce you to some interesting characters along the way. Are you ready? Your ride starts now. What is up, friend? Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Dr. Brooke on the Block. If you are new here, welcome. You are in for an exciting ride. And for those of you who are returning for yet another wild, exhilarating ride in the wild, wild west of Web3, welcome back. So excited you are here. I am Dr. Brooke, the Crypto Practor, and I will be your guide today. While the ride is warming up, I wanted to take a moment and share with you some of the key concepts to take away from today's episode. So first up, we are going to be talking about traditional and non-traditional forms of financial systems or financial uh, products that are available to us. And then I want to talk to you also about how DeFi will change the way that we exchange, we as people exchange uh, goods and services in today's market. And last but not least, uh, how to get started with DeFi. So if this interests you, I'm very excited you're here. If you are like, what is this DeFi? Like, what is she talking about? Stay with me till the very end. I promise you, you are going to learn a ton. On that note, what is DeFi? Let's define the terminology uh, before we get started, and you'll get to kind of see how all of this uh, works and weaves together. So decentralized finance, the terminology DeFi is a shortened version of decentralized finance. And essentially what that is, is a new and emerging financial system that is built on blockchain technology. If you didn't catch the prior episode before this, go back, listen to what is blockchain technology, how it's going to shift the world. Also, episode one, the very first episode of the podcast, I do go a little bit deeper into the history of blockchain technology, what it is, and help you get a deeper understanding. I feel like we need to kind of hammer in some of these topics to really help them stick with you. So on that note, this newly emerging financial system that is built on blockchain technology. It uses automated programs, aka smart contracts, to help this ecosystem go. So where traditional finance works like this, we go, we put our money, we open an account at a bank, and we put our money into that bank. And that bank then issues us checks, they issue us a debit card, they issue us, you know, routing and uh, account numbers so that we can either use wire transfers or checks or the debit card to transact. Now, we use those, those products that the banking system, the centralized banking system, allows us to use, and they are making money as a result of us using their products, right? They are in business to make money. Makes sense that they would be receiving transaction fees. Every time that debit card is swiped, they receive transaction fees. Also, the merchant terminal gets transaction fees on that. And then the company, let's say you're going to Starbucks and you're buying a coffee, Starbucks pays a fee for that terminal. That terminal makes money, the bank makes money, and so on. So the traditional system works in a way where there is a centralized bank. We we go to that centralized bank, we deposit our funds into there, and then they give us access to those funds by allowing us to use the different products that they offer. And we're able to then, you know, have the things that we want in life or the material goods or the services or the, you know, things that, that we enjoy. So how does decentralized financing, how does that like work, so to speak? 
the way the differentiating factor between centralized financing and decentralized financing is it takes all those third parties out. It removes the third parties and it allows us to transact with one another. There are transaction fees, however, to transact with one another utilizing blockchain technology. Part of those transaction fees can show up like gas fees, they're called gas fees. And that is the network fee to use that system. But these fees, what makes these this so different is these fees are so low compared to this traditional model of financing and anybody can use it. So there's a large, 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 and I won't even pretend to know the number, but it is a large number of people that are unbanked in the entire world. This is not just the U.S. economy, but in the world, there's a large population of people unbanked that don't have bank accounts that aren't able to access these financial products that people with bank accounts can access. So there's low transaction fees. You can also use DeFi protocols, use DeFi pro, uh, products just merely by having a cell phone and an internet connection. And maybe you don't even need a cell phone necessarily, I will say that loosely, because you can operate a lot of transactions on the blockchain just using your computer. I do utilize my phone a lot, so I have some of the apps and do those kind of things. But for the most part, you don't need those products or you don't have to have a cell phone. You just have to have an internet connection and be able to get on to the web to do these transactions. So what are the other ways that DeFi protocols are different than traditional finance is through allowing uh, lending, like different lending protocols. You'll hear some of the terminology if you're doing any sort of research into this space or trying to dive deeper in your understanding of it. You'll hear terms like staking, liquidity pools, yield farms, all of those are ways of lending and borrowing your assets. So you purchase a cryptocurrency, you're going to lend it out to somebody else to use that, or you're going to put it into a liquidity pool. The person who's running the liquidity pool that is housing all of the assets is getting a cut for, for being the validator of that since not all of us want to or can be validators on the blockchain. But if they decide, hey, I'm going to create a liquidity pool and I'm going to be a validator for this blockchain, give me your assets, put your assets in the pool, and I will give you X percentage back. So they give you a percentage back and they keep a small percentage. So you're utilizing these lending and borrowing protocols that you wouldn't be able to access through a typical bank if you're using only traditional finance methods, right? So DeFi allows people to have a lot more control over their funds. And because it is decentralized, the, the stakes or the control of it is distributed among all the different shareholders in the system instead of just you know, the, the small portion of the rich is getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, but really kind of taking our power back, taking our power back. That is allowing us to do uh, what we need to do. So just to summarize this one point before I move on to the next thing is centralized financing. The money is held by banks, corporations. They are, you know, making money because they're in business to make money. The banks make, I used to work at a bank. Uh, my payroll was funded by the fees that we charged, overdraft fees, uh, uh, interest on loan payments. All of that is how the bank is making money among a myriad of other ways in this fi traditional finance system. So they are the ones who facilitate the movement between parties. Wells Fargo talks to Bank of America, they facilitate uh, that movement. So an example here is if you purchase a gallon of milk using the credit card, that charge goes from the merchant. So let's say the grocery store is Safeway, that charge goes to Safeway to the inquiring bank. So Wells Fargo to Safeway. And then those card details get forwarded to the credit card network credit card network charges the uh, the Safeway for utilizing that network. 
the bank clears the payment, says, yes, Dr. Brooke has those funds in her account for that gallon of milk, uh, non-dairy milk. Let's go with almond milk for me. And the bank approves that charge. So once your bank approves the charge, sends the approval to the network through the acquiring bank, back to the merchant, there are so many hands and people in the pot. With blockchain technology, with DeFi protocols, it's you, or it's you, it's me, and it's the, that transaction fee for the validator who's validating that transaction on the block, who's saying, yes, this is a valid transaction. Dr. Brooke is sending X amount of cryptocurrency to this user for the goods of having a gallon of almond milk. And that's it. And it's a depending on the blockchain, I will say it depends on that is the percentage of fees that you pay. And if there's a lot of transactions in the queue to process through, you can pay a higher fee for that. But as the technology continues to evolve, you do pay less and less and less because it's getting better and better and better as we go. And it's not having to require so much time and energy to make happen. So loans cost money, loan applications cost money to happen. You know, it can take days to be approved. Um, you not, may not be able to use a certain bank's financial services because you're overseas or you're in a foreign country. There's so many barriers to the traditional finance system that are now being opened up with, with DeFi protocols. So that is a huge advantage as to how DeFi is going to, moving on to the next point that I want you to take away from this, is how DeFi is going to change the world, is breaking down those barriers. On a prior episode, I got to speak with Simon uh, Amory about different DeFi protocols and his process or his work in that and what he's teaching people through it. And I thought it was really cool. He made an amazing uh, statement and I quoted him actually on that uh, about how we can send text messages, we can send WhatsApp messages, we can send all sorts of Venmo payments instantly, you know, but trying to transact through the traditional model of sending money, I got to send money to a cousin in Norway or somebody in another country or another state, it could take days to get there. There's all of this, this mess of delay. And we're now living in a world where we can instantly send so many different things back and forth, except for money. So this is where DeFi is really going to start to take a, a strong stand and help break down these fine, uh, these barriers in which these you know central or these centralized banks are unable to do at the time. And this is why they're trying to figure out their ways now to figure out this world because they are going to be completely left behind and lose an aspect of their already engaged population and not be able to serve the unbanked population because the unbanked population is going to enter Web3 and understand these DeFi protocols more and more and more and more because more technology is coming out, more education is coming out, and better systems overall. So let's talk about the different financial products that DeFi uses that is very similar to centralized banking but can be beneficial for you. So there are peer-to-peer -peer financial transactions, right? It's a P2P DeFi transactions where two parties, myself and you, agree to exchange a cryptocurrency. So for the sake of it, we're gonna use Ethereum because a lot of people understand Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm just gonna use Ethereum. So these two parties, I say, hey, I wanna purchase your mountain bike for half an Ethereum. Now, if you know the price of Ethereum, that's about five or $600 at this given time of the recording for that mountain bike. So you and I decide we're gonna create a smart contract on the blockchain, which is very simple to do. There are aspects and programs depending on what blockchain you use. In this case, since we're using Ethereum, we have to use their native token. So we would be operating on an Ethereum blockchain create a smart contract saying I'm purchasing your mountain bike for $500, $600, which half an ETH at that point. So we would exchange that without having a third party involved. So consider it like, it like this. You're getting a loan from your centralized bank. And so you need to go to the bank. 
like, ha, you know, have the lender, you have to apply for one. If you're approved, you pay for interest, you have service fees, or, you know, in, in the instance, let's say you're not applying for a loan for the bike, but you're actually paying for it full out. You're saying, okay, here's the five or $600 for the bike. There's, there's transactional fees that might be a part of that. You know, I understand it's a very simple explanation because people might be thinking, oh, well, I can just go offer up and I can just go to their home and give them five or $600. And that's a peer to peer transaction. And that's very simple. And that's essentially what DeFi is doing. It's allowing that peer to peer, except you don't have to have the local walls or proximity in your world. You can just absolutely work globally. And it's not just with mountain bikes, it's with everything and having these peer-to-peer -peer protocols. So with the peer-to-peer -peer lending, I would say I'm lending somebody something in Switzerland. I don't have to be in Switzerland to make that lending happen. I don't have to have the Swiss dollar to make that happen. I can use the native currency for whatever blockchain, Ethereum, that I'm utilizing, and there won't be interest and fees. You know, it does mean that there are many, many other options that me as the lender can like have as I open up my lending services to the world. If I'm the lender, if I'm the borrower, I have many more options. Again, I'm not confined to the local parameters of my local bank or, you know, purchasing things through other states and, and whatnot. So the way that this works, like how do you get started with DeFi if this is something that you're looking at? So DeFi, you would use a decentralized app, like finance app, like application in the Web3 world. This is the term D app, DAP, small little d, uppercase A, P, P, so DAP, to enter your loan needs. So you're going to enter, hey, I need two ETH which essentially would be about $2,000, a little over $2,000 for two ETH. And um, an algorithm, it will match me up with people that are lending to ETH. So I can see all of these people that are loaning to ETH to me or willing to loan to ETH to me. And I can say, put in my application, hey, would you let me borrow these two ETH for X, Y, and Z? And all I have to do is agree to that lender's term, and they're going to give me that two ETH. Now I can take that two ETH and turn it in for, for my currency. My, my global currency that I use is US dollar or Federal Reserve note more specifically. And, um, and I can do what I need to do with it and pay like according to that lender's terms. Now, because these lender terms when they're agreed upon are done through smart contracts, those payments are automatically like taken out and paid back. So there's not this, there is a potential for default, but there isn't a potential of me just like going running rampant and not taking care of these. It is like executed immediately when the payment is due. My accounts would be linked to it to execute the transaction. The smart contract would make it happen. So Again, this is all done through computer applications, computer programming with blockchain technology. This is what makes DeFi so unique and so different. So um, because the technology is still developing, there are things to really pay attention to when you are getting started in DeFi. There are so many different DeFi protocols with different chains. They have their own native token right? So you have the Ethereum blockchain, but then you have other DeFi protocols on there that have their own tokens that you would transact with that you would use for those transaction fees. So it's important to understand, again, each blockchain is like its own country and it has its own currency. And within that, that ecosystem or that country, there's towns and there's cities and there's, you know, uh, other things that are involved in that process. And while I'm talking about breaking down the barriers of you being confined to your town and your city and being able to open up the whole world for your financing needs and allowing people who are unbanked 
to utilize these different protocols and bring peer-to-peer -peer systems back. I just want you to understand, just conceptualize the idea that every single blockchain is different in its type of currency that it uses. So I use the example of like a country, but it doesn't mean that it can't go beyond that those walls. There are, I, I don't mean to get you in the weeds right now. Uh, we'll talk about it on a different episode, but there are things like bridges uh, that allow different blockchains to communicate. And that's going to open up, widely open up the whole DeFi protocol, even more so when you're allowed to do different DeFi protocols or utilize different DeFi programs on one blockchain with the currency of another one. So that is going to be for an entirely different episode. For now, I want you to just understand how traditional finance works, how we are as a population of people. I don't want to say it like rash or really brass, uh, but we are kind of getting screwed in the process. We don't have the same power that they do. They are the big, powerful decision makers. They decide if they're going to make a loan to us. They decide if we're worthy. They decide if, you know, all of it. And in this case, with the peer-to-peer, -peer, we have the ability to, A, offer, you know, our assets up in, in a borrowing lending protocol should we choose. We also have the power through the smart contracts to make sure there's no defaults and have access to getting some kickbacks, some staking rewards for allowing a chain or a person to borrow our assets. I've made, you know, tons of native tokens in the blo in a blockchain by allowing my assets to be staked. So you earn rewards, staking rewards. Those assets go up in value like in a bull market that has a, the potential to really shift things around for you financially. So while some people might say, well, those assets don't have like monetary value right now, that could be a disadvantage for some people. But understand if you're investing in a good DeFi protocol, if you're looking and putting money into a good chain blockchain that's going to stick around, then you are going to make some significant cash in the near future. In the next few years, when you look back and go, dang, I should have listened to what she had to say, or I should have researched more. So if you have questions about these protocols, reach out. I'm happy to help like break some of this stuff down to you. If you still feel like you're lost, if you feel like you're in the weeds, totally get it. I get it because it takes a lot of time to understand, but that is why I want you to really truly do your research. If you have already, if you have not already downloaded my words of web three in the show notes below, you can click on get access to that. You will get a dictionary, a mini dictionary to be able to look up terminology and it's all in alphabetical order. So if you hear somebody on a YouTube channel or I said a word that didn't make sense, you can flip the page, find that word and help you get it defined. So this can be more understanding or more understandable for you in the future. On that note, we are pulling back into the station. Please review. If you haven't already rate and review this show, please do so. It really helps me get this out to more people. I know I say that in the closing uh, audio, but I really want to also kind of let you guys know it's, it's so important to helping expand this knowledge to more and more people. Because you know what? It's fun in, world, in Web3 when we have friends around and a support system and a community. And that's what makes this whole thing incredibly unique. So on today's ride, I hope you learned what DeFi is, how it's different than traditional finance, how you can be a part of it, and how it's shifting and shaping the world in which we operate with financial services. Take care, and I will talk to you soon. You made it. Congratulations. That wasn't so bad, was it? I hope you laughed and learned a little bit more about this Web3 universe and how simple and fun it can really be. Would you be so kind as to leave us a review and share it with your friends and family? It would mean so much to get this out to more people as we embark on the greatest transfer of wealth that has ever happened in human history. Can't wait to see you on the next one.